thank you so much for joining us at this year's English Pen Literary Salon. Delighted you can be here. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Xiaolu Guo, who's one of the most distinguished writers at work today. In 2013, she was voted one of Granter's best of young British novelists. So the format of the event today will be a short reading followed by a discussion between us and there will also be plenty of time for questions at you at the end. So do think about what you might like to ask Xiaolu. Xiaolu was born in South China where she grew up in a small fishing village before studying film at the Beijing Film Academy. She published six books in China before she moved to London in 2002. The English translation of Village of Stone was shortlisted for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize and nominated for the International Impact Dublin Literary Award. Her first novel written in English, a concise Chinese-English dictionary for lovers, was shortlisted for the Orange Prize for Fiction. And 20 Fragments of a Ravenous Youth, published in 2008, was longlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize. Xiaolu's film career also continues to flourish and includes her feature, She, a Chinese, and her documentary, Once Upon a Time Proletarian, which has been screened at international festivals such as Venice and Toronto Film Festivals. Her new novel is I Am China, which is an abs absolutely beautiful cover as well. And Xiaolu will be signing copies, so do go and buy a copy at the end if you haven't got it already. It's a compelling and richly evocative story in which Iona Kirkpatrick is a translator living in London and translates letters between an exiled Chinese musician awaiting his fate in a detention center in Dover and his girlfriend back in Beijing. <coughs> so, Welcome, Shalu. A round Thank of applause, you. please, for Shalu. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is okay? The sound? I feel like I need to yell more. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to start first with the really intriguing title, I Am China, which I understand has its origin in an Allen Ginsberg poem, no less. And it's an interesting story about how you substituted America for China. So I wondered if you could share with us more about that and about how the novel came about. Yeah, I, um, I used to have a band, like a slam poetry band, but sometimes I sing and with a ukulele. And the band is called the Sabotage Sister and the Syndicate. So Sabotage Sister is supposed to be me, and then the Syndicate is supposed to be three really professional musicians. And I couldn't really sing at all. But this band going around in Europe, uh, because I used to live in Berlin and, um, and uh, Paris for a bit. And so we sing some songs, mainly it's me reading some poems from B Generation. <laughs> and uh, in the band I was uh, reading Alan Ginsberg's How and America. But I was always very naughty, you know, I changed some key words in Ginsberg's poem, especially this poem called America by, by Ginsberg in 1956. Because in this poem, all these words, American, is so, um, somehow it speaks to me like as if China now is going through the whole American process. You know, from the 50s onwards, after the war, China is going through this American process even more dramatically than America itself. So I just changed this word America into China, and then I did a lot of per performance um, everywhere, and it was just kind of funny poem. But later on, when I started to write this book, and I thought that was quite important spirit, you know, how I got inspiration to work with the characters. Um, they are so, I mean, some characters in my books, they are very unreal because they are very intellectual. You know, it's like Chinese version of uh, Johnny Rotten or Chinese version of Ellen Ginsberg. And I thought, I really need to have this cover version of America by Ginsberg in my, in my book. Um, I think we're gonna have very short time so maybe I'm just going to read like uh, three verses of this cover version uh, by Ginsberg, and then we can, whatever starts from there. Um, so I, I, I'm aware, because if whenever I read this poem in China, I, you know, it's not very, it's not very uh, safe condition. But, you know, I'm here, but although camera is here, but I'm going to read it anyway. Um, so this poem is written, of course, by Ginsberg, but it's rewrote by this uh, a Chinese young poet girl called Mu, and she was traveling with a band in America. And here she goes, China, China, I give you all and now I'm nothing. China, $2.27. I can't stand my own mind, China. When will we end the human war, China? Go fuck yourself with your atom bomb, China. 
I don't feel good, don't bother me, China. I won't write my poem until I'm in my right mind. China, when will you be angelic, China? When will you take off your clothes, China? When will you look at your, yourself through the graveyard, China? When will you be worthy of your million toroskites? China, why are your libraries full of tears, China? China, when will you, when will you send your eggs to India? I'm sick of your insane demands. When can I go into a supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks, China? China, after all, it is you and I who are perfect, but not the rest of the world. China, your machinery is too much for me. China, you made me want to be a saint. There must be some other way to settle this argument, China. Borrow is in Tangier, and I don't think you will be back this sinister. Are you being sinister, or is this some form of practical joke, China? I'm trying to come to the point, China. I refuse to give up my obsession, China. China, stop pushing. I know what I'm doing, China. The plum blossom are falling. So this actually was a long poem, and I just, I read you three verses, because actually you know what's, what's the rest of the poem anyway. Yeah. Thank you, that was beautiful reading. And you started off by um, telling us how you were in a band. And music is actually a fascinating theme throughout the novel, and particularly its intersection with politics. And Jean said, I was feverishly in love with rock and roll. I was wondering if you could speak more about that role mm. of music in yeah. the novel, and, particularly, and also the relationship between art and politics, which is very fraught yeah. throughout. I guess, um, like, the way I, I become a writer or a filmmaker, like, not really directly inspired from literature, but really, you know, first thing is, it's really like the rock and roll music in the third world, because in China, I mean, you can imagine, like, if you're in China or in Latin America or in India, you kind of, you know, you create a second-hand rock and roll music. Um, but then, you know, I was 20, very, very late, you know, like 19 or 20, 21. Then the first time I heard, like, there's, there's a band called the Sex Pistol or there's a band called the Clash, you know, the Doors, all that. And I think it's very funny, like, these things are so long ago, you know, from the 60s, but, but in, the, in 2000, I was, you know, the first time hear those bands in China. And I think it was so strong because I grew up in a very closed off society, very communist household. My parents are very hardcore communist. So those things are very alien to me when I was young. But once you, you heard those things, it, it becomes so strong, you know, in my, in my literature creation world. And I think I learned how to write a novel from the lyrics, you know, for example, the lyrics from Leonard Cohen. I try to imitate those lyrics, mm. or John Lennon, you know, like the way they write lyrics, and I will write my novel. And, um, and I think that's really crucial for me to create a youth feverishly in love with Western rock and roll. And this character will be man, you know, a 20 something years old man. Mm. So this is the first novel I tried to write from a very young male punk's point of view, which was quite difficult for me, really. I mean, just like, so in order to write this novel, I had to, <laughs> it's the first time I had to read all this biography by Johnny Rotten or you know, Bob Dylan, you know, um, uh, Morrison, you know, all this biography by those pop stars, just to get their vocabularies into my vocabulary and to kind of transfer me into a young man in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's for the character, the musician in the, in the novel, their journey to expression is so much more fraught than a musician working, say, in England, in London, where we are now. It's fraught with politics. For example, Xi'an says, there is no art without political commitment. All art is political expression. And, I mean, you, you have a personal experience of this as well. I mean, your artist father spent 15 years in a prison camp in the 50s and during the Cultural Revolution. Did that form your interest in, you know, how artists, how musicians have the freedom to express themselves? Absolutely. I think, you know, this is a... The subject was very big, you know, in my life. Like an artist should engage with society, and then I brought the idea to London. You know, I left China 13 years ago. And then I lived in in West Europe, 
And I talk about this idea, and a lot of people laugh at me, especially in England. They say, but we're in postmodern world. What are you talking about? You are not a politician. You know, an artist should be pure. And I was like, what do you mean pure? Um, and I think I got a bit kind of bombarded, especially in Germany. You know, lots of German artists, I think, scarred by the, by the Nazi war, you know. And they tried to really write novels without political uh, implication. And I remember I got into the fight in, in Berlin and Hamburg, you know, argue about, you know, a writer should be absolutely political, but not in the, in the propaganda way, you know. And I think they were saying, well, you were really some 19th century, silly, old romantic writer. And I think I was thinking of, about this subject a lot these years, you know, since now I live in Europe, really, you know, last 15, 13 years, and I don't think I will ever return to China. And I said, I have to write a book really you know, about a political artist got prosecuted in their own country, but also prosecuted in Europe as well, mm -hmm. and there's nowhere for them to go. And uh, so that's, you know, that's the idea to write this book with everybody so madly in love with the idea, you know, the ideology of the society, but they also try to be a musician, be a poet. And also, I, I have been very obsessed with this Russian writer, um, Alexander, Alexander Sozanense. Mm, mm. And I think, like, I know Sozanense's life, like, every single detail when he left Russia to America. As if I know, you know, that's my father's life in a way. And I have this idea, like, well, what if there's a young Alexander Sozanense from China, you know, excel in Europe rather than in America? So I just kind of thought, you know, those kind of mad ideas, I had to cook those ideas in the novel. And I think, Lots of people said that this novel is not really easy to read because too many ideas and too little story. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> of course, of course, you know, that will be the consequence, you know, when they have four ideas. And then I so, you know, I'm not very good with, with kind of traditional narrative. And I know, you know, that's my character. And I mm -hmm. said, well, I try, you know, I try next time. I'll give you a better story. <laughs> yeah. Well, that take, leads us nicely, a nice segue into the theme of style, which is so important, I think, and makes your work so original because it has got this innovative, experimental style. And I think you've previously said, I don't trust plot, I trust voice and poetic flow. And there is kind of this beautiful lyricism throughout the novel and also experimenting with different textualities. For example, you have the letters and um, fragments of poetry. And it'd be great to hear more about your kind of adventures in style, as it were, and how, mm. I mean, how important that is to you. And I yeah. know that you're also a filmmaker, so it's fascinating how you're, you're working in these different artistic styles, film, music, and then um, yeah. literature. I think that, like, really, you know, when you change your language to write, it's, it's very... It's a very big freedom and a scary, scary freedom. Mm. Because I wrote uh, 10 books when I was in China, so... I published more than that. I also was working for two magazines in China, you know, write film critics once a week when I was in China. So I wrote a lot in Chinese, and I did have my own Chinese style, you know, very short sentence, slightly like Chairman Mao's Little Red Book. Because I, I know my Chinese language writing is it's post-revolutionary style, you know, short sentence, you know, little red book influence, you know, a bit revolutionary, silly language, you know. And I like that, you know, it's very punctual. But once I immigrated to London, I lost that. And I, when I decided to write in English, which was really from zero, I had no education in English, I never went to English school. And that was such a, a painful process to find my language in my book. And I think suddenly I become a very different person. Um, I tried a different novel. So, for example, you know, I, I pick all this Victoria literature, you know, you know, Austin, Jane Austen, you know, Charlotte uh, Bronte sisters. I couldn't really inherit that kind of English language. And I decided that, that is not my writing. I throw away those Victoria literature because it doesn't belong to my vocabulary. Then I tried to pick up some other stuff, you know. So for example, I mentioned Leona Cohen. Mm -hmm. I feel really close to Leonard Cohen's language. And then I start to read all the Leonard Cohen novels, you know, Beautiful Losers, all that. I loved it. And I thought, maybe North American English will be my English. So then I said, well, then I will read, you know, I will read again all the B generation in English, since I read them in Chinese. 
And I did, you know, I pick up, you know, all the beat generation, especially Charles Bukowski, mm. because the language is so dirty, so gritty, and so streetwise. And it's very easy for a foreigner like me to, to, to imitate it, you mm -hmm. know, because it's really like a, a little swear in the street. Uh, you would talk to, you know, your lover, your boyfriend in that kind of language. And I think that was a process. I tried to find my own English, which is really North American English. Mm -hmm. But I'm living in London. It's such a, you know, a dilemma and a contradiction. But, but for a foreigner like me, a foreign writer, and I eventually, I think that would be the the vocabulary of my language. So I slowly discovered that kind of English. But then once, you know, when I start to read Jim Coetzee, I think that kind of English, especially in the disgrace, I thought, okay, that kind of English maybe is something I can learn, it's much simpler, lucid, simpler. Mm -hmm. It's devoid of historical shadow, you know, like Victoria literature, I just couldn't really digest. And I thought, okay, maybe that kind of English would be the future English I would try to pick up to learn you know so so because my sensitivity towards language I think really create my novel has this strange language style you know sometimes you read quite kind of traditional and sometimes like very modern language and this inconsistency which I'm aware of, totally and I feel embarrassed when an English writer reading my book, I said, oh, no, he's going to discover all the problems. <laughs> and it was like, in India, I'm, I feel much more confident, you know, talking to India writer or Singapore writer. So, yeah, well, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's my language. And um, the acknowledgments for I Am China are incredibly moving. You described it as one of the most demanding and difficult projects you've worked on so far and also written during a period of time in which you were deciding which place to call home, which I thought was particularly poignant because the theme of home is so powerful throughout the novel. I mean, did that influence that theme in the novel that you were particularly looking for a place to call home yourself while you were writing it? Or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, also when you mentioned the, my filmmaking life, mm. you know, mm. it's also like I, I was trained as a filmmaker, you know, for 10 years and for the last 20 years I've been making film. I thought, well, filmmaking is my home. You know, if you commit to filmmaking, which means you would have no real home. You have to carry the camera mm -hmm. and you're taking 20 men you know, to the location, you know. And um, I felt very lonely in a way, you know, the drifting along, always drift along. There's never a um, final stop. And um, getting older mm -hmm. also is a problem, you know, to kind of reconcile, re recreate your second home rather than in China. And I thought, okay, you know, okay, London is not perfect, but since I'm using this language to write my novels, you know, I should settle down in the English-speaking mm -hmm. world, which I think could be London. So then I felt more settled down for the last two or three years mm -hmm. in East London. And in fact, I had to stop filmmaking for three years. And I, now I feel like, oh, it's so far away because once I stop filmmaking, I can really live in my house, you know, in London. Mm -hmm. And I start to write more stuff. And I, indeed, I think last three years I wrote much more stuff mm -hmm. because I didn't really make any film. Um, and I guess I think home is like it's a middle age crisis in a way. You know, I, I, I still see myself as like you know 20 years old body, but but in my mind or my experience is really 40 years old uh, experience. And I think that certain decision has to be made you know, had to throw away some kind of bohemian idea of, <laughs> of lifestyle yeah. and um, kind of root, root somewhere, mm. which I don't entirely believe, you know, like, I really, I don't entirely believe living in London somehow. Uh, it feels too, it feels the space is too um, full of battle and struggle in a way, you know, it's not a very harmonic place to live. Mm. But, uh, but again, you know, the decision made me to, to root here more to make a family here, basically, mm -hmm. yeah. And you grew up in a small fishing village in South China, and the sea is very powerful throughout all of your work, and I think you're tackling it now in non-fiction as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And is that something, that, that imagery, is that important to you to continue Absolutely. using Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I wrote a lot about East China Sea, you know, mm -hmm. the very smelly sea, because the sea there is somehow not for dive, you know, for, for serving or diving or for swimming. It's absolutely materi materialistic sea, you know, it's, it's you plant all the, all the seaweeds, kelp, you know. So 
The sea I grew up with is full of kelp, you know, so people have to grow kelp, to sell the kelp, and it's very smelly. Mm -hmm. And then lots of um, farming, lobster, you know, farming oyster. And that's the sea I grew up with, like it's a food, food, uh, you know, supermarket in open place, you know. Um, I think I, I do miss that, mm -hmm. because the sea for us is, is like, is the, the ultimate place to survive rather than to mm -hmm. have a leisure. And um, I felt totally cut off from that very agricultural society, which is physical laboring on the, on the material, you know, to, to scavenge in the food to live for the next day. Um, and yet I live in, I think, really quite postmodern city like London, you know, so much about technology and banking. You know, it's all on, in the head. And there's very little on the physical reality. Um, I think that made me feel very alienated mm -hmm. in, in West Europe. So I'm just kind of sometimes wondered, um, oh, maybe I should uh, you know, move back to, to South Asia. If I can't, uh, maybe I'll move back to Australia. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's close to China, you know. <laughs> and on the theme, you mentioned the sense of alienation, which leads in to my final question, which was about the whole theme of alienation and exile, because the novel um, is hugely powerful in depicting the detention center in Dover, where this exiled musician is um, writing letters to the Buckingham Palace and the Queen. I mean, it's a fascinating um, depiction of power and the powerless and the, the tension between the powerful and the powerless, having this person in a detention center writing um, futile letters to the, the Queen. and. I mean, it'd be great. I mean, it's such a topical subject matter as well, the theme of immigration mm. and detention centers. And I mean, it's, you've had experience yourself of the yeah. immigration process yeah. and, trying, and the visa struggles. Yeah. And About 10 years ago, I had a, like four month um, expired visa in London. And, uh, and I had a, like three or four months have this situation called a stateless. Mm. Um, it was a really scary situation because, you know, when you're intellectual, you write about, you know, like stateless, you know, as 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 an artist uh, state, you know, you don't belong to any authority. But when you're legally stateless, it's really scary because I couldn't really return to China mm. and I don't have a legal visa here. And I remember I was hiring two lawyers, very, very expensive lawyers, to try to help me to legalize me, you know, with either country. And it didn't work out. And I, my visa got refused again and again. And uh, I had a situation very much like this character who writes to the queen. But I didn't write to the queen. I didn't believe that. So, <laughs> but I wrote to someone more useful, Samar Rushdie, actually. <laughs> it was 10 years ago. I remember I wrote a letter to Samar Rushdie, but vile, you know, because he was still very secret at that time, you know, for his own security. So I remember the New York Pan organization took my letter. So New York Pan, they took this, my personal letter, sent to Samir Rushdie, where, you know, and I always say, but where is his real address? Because I would love to send a postcard to say thank you, you know, afterwards. They said, no, 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 that's it, that's it. And, uh, and I I, res and I think uh, two months later, I received a very formal letter from UK Home Office Immigration Center saying, you know, lots of important people want to support your case. Now you are being granted, you know, for the legal, st legal status, you know, you're no longer stateless. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a really a trauma in my life, you know, really first time experience that stateless situation, which you are legally have nothing, you can do nothing. And, um, so that was really painful. I mean, it's really a really horrible situation. Mm -hmm. So I thought the character has to suffer that. Um, but instead of writing to Samir Rushdie, you know, he should write to the queen, you know. And, uh, and so, so there's two letters to the queen, which kind of I wrote actually, I think five years ago when I started to construct this novel, I had these two letters to the queen. You know, very first thing I wrote this letter, I said that will be the beginning of the novel. And uh, after five years of writing, the novel changed totally. And these two letters remained. I thought that's really important to, mm. to keep those letters, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. I would love to talk to you for much longer, but um, I think it's, we need to open it up to questions from the audience now. So, yes. Please, yeah. Questions? Oh, yeah, we have microphones as well. I think we have maybe eight minutes of uh, question and answer, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Two questions really related to each other and related to what you were saying about language. Do you ever write in Chinese? And also, 
What kind of advantages do you think uh, writing in a second language offers uh, to a writer like yeah. yourself? Yeah. Um, I think for the last 10 years, I, I deliberately refused to write in Chinese. Deliberately. And it's very strange because I still get email you know, from some Chinese magazine say, would you like a you know, write a little column about England, you know, for some magazine in Guangzhou, Shanghai. And I just said no. And I felt this kind of commitment to one language as a writer, you know. Because, you know, like Milan Kundala said, you know, language is identity. But then he's contradicting himself, you know, because he used to write in Czech when he was in Czechoslovakia. And Kundala left the Czech, living in Paris for the last, what, 20 years. And he, he only writes in French now. And does that mean his, his identity change? And I was thinking the modern writers, now more and more writers writing in two or three language. You know, I think the new generation writers, it's not they are greater or whatever, it's just their, the life experience becomes so globalized. So, you know, they, maybe they were born in Tokyo, living in Tokyo for 20 years, and then they moved to New York for you know, next, the rest of their life. And they will write between Japanese or, or English. And this become more and more situation for the new generation writers. And I think I am, in a way, you know, in this transition, which I have to commit to myself to write in one language, try to master that language. And I don't think I can ever master writing English because I lived 30 years my life in China. But on the other hand, um, if I can ever conquer <laughs> writing in my second language, you know, I thought, I still feel very difficult writing in English, you know, although speaking is fine, I can make all the mistakes, you know, while I speak, but writing is different. And I thought maybe, you know, from next 10 years onwards, I will start writing in Chinese again. But here's a political problem. When I write in Chinese, I overwhelmed by certain self-censorship, because if you write in Chinese, you will hope your manuscript will be published in China first, rather than in the West. And then you know certain subject you will never get published in China. So that's actually very damaging to write your own language in a country you're never going to publish. Um, so I think writing in another language gives me, give me this political freedom in my head. And this is so complex, like, you know, writing English really give me a very kind of, you know, inno innocent state, which I don't worry about certain subject at all, you know. So I think this language thing is beyond the linguistic difficulty and even beyond the political identity. Um, because in the end, you want a certain kind of mental freedom, you know, rather than technical freedom. Because technical freedom, you can, you can get by, you can get conquered, you can get editors to help you. So it's quite complex. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any uh, other yeah. question? Yeah. This microphone, yeah. Um, thanks. Um, I was really struck by what you said about those two letters that you wrote first and then felt that you had to keep even as the novel changed. And I'm wondering about something that an editor said to me recently. They said, oh, kill your darlings. And I was wondering whether certain darlings shouldn't be killed. Like if as a writer you feel that something is really important and you have to keep it, does the rest of the work shape itself around it? You mean diary? Darlings. Darlings. The expression, the, kill oh, your darlings. Sorry. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So I was wondering what your take is on that, whether you feel that sometimes if you really don't want to kill something, then yeah. you can reshape the work around it. I think I'm still, I guess I'm still really learning, although I wrote quite many books, but I feel really a beginner. I felt really a beginner because maybe because I'm writing second language and I don't really know much of this culture, you know. So all my sensibility is still very Eastern Chinese one, very Asian one. Um, that means I'm a pr primitive writer. I think a primitive writer is, is you, you, you're not yet divorced with your first-hand emotion and um, passion. You know, for example, for example, Ul Ulipo, yeah, the Ulipo group, um, the whole you know, French Italian experimental writers group, and. I actually met one of the Ulipo group. He told me, the French writer, he told me, you need to divorce with your original passion in order to make your novel much more, uh, much more philosophical, you know, go beyond the realistic level. And that divorce is very important. I couldn't really do that yet. 
and you, know, you can say, you know, for, for better or for worse, we shouldn't divorce our original passion. But, but sometimes the original passion is a problem when you construct a much more complex novel. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I struggle with it. Um, for example, my novel, Dictionary, a concise Chinese English dictionary for lovers, it's so raw, it's so raw. Um, because I wrote a little diary, you know, I, had, I still have this diary when I arrived in England from China. I said every day I will work out all these new vocabularies in English, you know, and then every day I will learn those vocabularies. And I remember, you know, some like four months later, I looked at that diary every day, you know, as a study, you know. I said, but that's not very narrative. So I just basically typed as a whole diary back onto my computer and I said, that's, that's the novel, you know, I will work on that. Um, and I remember first time when I, when I sent to my agent and my publishers, he said, look, that's not enough. It's so raw that there's no thread in it. There's no, there's no path for the others to follow. Only you can follow. And at that moment I realized you do need to, to transform this rawness, the original, you know, what, what you said called darling, you know, the very original idea into something cooked which is no longer you can really tell the original, original character anymore. You know? And I think that's a process quite painful because some you have to throw away and some you have to transform, cook it, even become very stereotype. You know, there's a process. You need to cook it into something people can recognize and can find as a common taste. Um, I think that process makes you become a writer. Otherwise, you're really a diary writer, you know. I, I think I, when, I, when I was young, I read a lot of uh, um, Anis Ning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anis Ning, you know, and I loved this uh, mm. robe, intimate description about mm. her sexual love, you know, in her diary. And I thought, okay, that's literature. But when I grow more, you know, grow older, and I realized to, to make a much more visionary story, you do need to go beyond that. And this is very snobbish literature word, you know, for women it's even harder to deliver something beyond your personal history. And I, I have to do that. So, okay, kill my darling, yes, I have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, I think we have just about run out of time. Yes, yeah, sadly, I'm sure we could talk all day, but... I, I, I will go there to the foyer, so if you want to talk to me there, yes, and sign um, books. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for a fascinating session. Congratulations again on the novel. It's one of the, the best that I've ever read, I think. What? And um, thank you all so much for coming and do stick around for the, the rest of the English Pen Literary Salon events as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.